Welcome. It's good to be here together. It's a beautiful day to worship the Lord. I'm uh, reveling in the sunshine of the warm south after being in Missouri last weekend. And we saw 10 degrees, we saw snow, and we're glad to be back in Florida where the sun shines and the grass is green enough. And it's good to be with y'all this morning. Turn for a text to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. I'm going to talk about a subject this morning of separation between the Christian and the non-Christian. Are we supposed to be a separate people? And what does it mean in the Bible when it says here in our text to come out and to be separate? And I don't know how far we're going to get. I don't know. This, this, this message was on my heart this week. And uh, I've, uh, it seems like I've put a lot of time and prayer into it. And I've got almost nowhere. So pray for me this morning that, that God would be able to use the scriptures. And that we could learn what we are supposed to be when it comes to a separate people. A Christian people that is separate from a non-Christian. 2 Corinthians number, uh, chapter number 6 and verse 14 it says... Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And that's a question. I read it wrong. That's a question. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, notice this, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And that is the word of God this morning. That is not my words. That's what the Bible says. So, how do we, how do you and I, come out and be separate? And what does that mean? What does that look like in practical living? So, how do we define this? Is separation or being separate, is it a doctrine? Is it? Amen. So, what does it look like? What does it look like today? What did it look like in the Old Testament? And I found fascinating stories in the Old Testament of God's call to be separate. Have anyone read the, the, the Nazarite chapter lately? Uh, it's just interesting what God asked of his people depending on what time in history and where, and where they were. And we know we're in the New Testament. We know we're in the New Covenant. But still we are called to be a separate people. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be yoked? It says to be not unequally yoked. What, is, what does that word mean? So we're going to look at some of that and see what the Bible says this morning. So this word separate, over here, I don't think I spelled that right. Let's see, that's right, I think that's right. All right, so what does this mean? What does it mean to separate? Is that not spelled right? Is it with an E? I got it right? Okay. So, according to Strong's or the original, it means to limit, exclude, divide, or sever. Pretty strong words. There is a difference. According to Webster's, it says to set apart or keep apart. To disconnect. Another, another thought of that word sever. And then this was a fascinating one. To make a distinction between. So keep that in mind. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about separate or separate, ever how, what, what uh, is the best form we used this morning. So we have a call here to come out and to be separate. Or to come out and to, or to be kept apart from something or somebody or a group. Or to sever from a certain place or people or whatever, association. We'll go into that more. Now this is talking about idols here. 
And, or it mentions idols here. And uh, anyways, we'll go into that later. <clears throat> it talks about not touching the unclean thing. And we could, we could go as far as we need to go with that. We know the world is full of unclean people, of unclean beliefs, of unclean actions. It calls us to be separate from that. So as born-again Christians here this morning, as believing in the Great Commission, that you and I are to go into the world and we're to preach and we're to teach and we're to share the gospel, we're to live the gospel to a lost and dying world. And if you were to follow the ministry of Jesus and you would, you would read of his healing and of his cleansing of the sick and the lame, and of the, the, the demon-possessed. Think about this. As, as, as you and I, as Christians today, trying to be separate, yet called into the world to minister. You know, you, we read the story about Jesus with a crowd around him, walking down that street, looking up in that sycamore tree, and inviting that, that sinner down out of that tree and going to eat with him or to have tea. Remember Jesus hanging on the cross in agony, the spotless Lamb of God, and looking over to the thief and saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. How does this factor in to you and I as born-again Christians living in a world that we're supposed to be separate from? Turn with me, if you will. We're going we're to kind of keep your finger here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go back to John chapter 17. <clears throat> we have the words of Jesus here. And this was right before he was going to be crucified. And I believe that he had his disciples gathered around. I believe he was talking to his disciples here. But I think this might help us understand a little bit how a Christian is supposed to be in this world. John chapter 17 and verse number 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And I believe he's talking about the disciples. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might also be sanctified through the truth. So we don't, we don't raise our, you know, we, 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 uh, when, when, our, when we were born, our parents, as soon as we could walk or, or see things, they didn't load us up in the car and go to the mountains and find a cave and live in a box. They didn't do that. None of your parents did that. Okay? They didn't keep us separate from the world in that way. Are you following me? Okay? <clears throat> Yet we, we believe, according to Scripture and according to what we've read, that the Christian is to be set apart in his belief system and in his practices. Yes, we rub shoulders with a lost and dying world. We talk to the unbeliever. We share with the down and out, the homeless, the drug addict. And we're not going to go into how to do that. But we're willing to get down in the trenches and work with people. What I want to look at this morning is there is to be a distinct difference between the believer and the non-believer. We're going to go back here a little bit to this verse, back to our text here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to be back here in verse 14. We're going to look, look at this word yoked a little bit here. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, and then it says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with un unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. So when we're yoked together with something or somebody, 
We are standing side by side. We're in step. We're carrying the same load. We're going the same direction. We're maybe even helping each other navigate the path of life. And I see that as a beautiful picture of brotherhood, of a church standing together, walking together, in step, carrying the same load, going the same direction. But it says here we're not to be yoked like this with unbelievers. So that means we need to guard carefully who we are in step with or guard carefully what direction we're going. There needs to be a difference. And it spells it out here kind of literally in black and white. It says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Light with darkness. So we cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. Yes, we can work with unbelievers. We can minister to unbelievers. We can show by our life and we can rub shoulders, so to speak, but we are not under the same yoke. Am I making sense? Is this, is this tracking? We have to be in the world, but not of the world. We can't be yoked together. And it goes on in verse number 16. I guess I want to see a base for this doctrine. And, I want to, and, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. I don't, like I said, I don't know how far we're going to get. But I want to develop a base for why the Christian has to be separate. It says here, and what agreement, in verse number 16 of our text, hath the temple of God with idols. Then it says, for ye, born again Christians, okay, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Ye are the temple of the living God. Does that not put fire in your step this morning? To know, dear people, that, that you are a part of the kingdom of God. You are a member. You are a temple of God. And that is the basis that we have this morning for a separated life. Because we are the temple of the living God. Verse number 16. Wait. I'm messing up here. 1 Corinthians. Back a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 16, yes, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye? Hold that thought, go with me to Ephesians, back the other way. Chapter 2, picking up in verse 19, Ephesians 2, 19. Now, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Notice these verses here. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. One more, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we have a clear picture here of what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us, trying to help us see that we are the temple of God and that this matters. It matters. We are to be different. We are to be separate. We are to be set apart because we are the temple of the living God. Paul asked this question. <clears throat> here in this in in, uh, in chapter six of First Corinthians, and he adds a little he adds a little emphasis to it. You know, Paul has asked these previous questions we read. He asks a little emphasis in verse nineteen. He says, "What? Like you didn't know this? Like this isn't real to you? That your that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost." 
So the question for me and for you this morning is, know, know ye that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you're a born-again Christian here this morning, the Holy Ghost dwells in you, and you are the temple. Verse 20 goes on to say, you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that's a base that I want to work off this morning as we go through here for a few more minutes of, of the subject of separation and what it means. Back to our text, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now, this was the first part of the verse that we looked at. Know ye not that your body is a temple of holy God, of the Holy Ghost? So, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now, if I understand this correctly, Paul would have been teaching or writing to the, the saved or the Christian Jews of that time. Might have been some Gentiles around. I may have it wrong. But think about that question that he answered, or he, he, that, he, that he gave. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? He uses this word picture here that probably shook these believers pretty, pretty tough. Pretty, pretty, shook them up pretty good, probably. Because, and I quote here, nothing could appear more ab abominable to a Jew than an idol in the temple of God. Here then could be no agreement. The worship of the two is wholly incompatible. An idolater never worships a true God. A Christian never worships an idol. If you join in idolatrous rites, it is impossible that you should be Christians, unquote. So think about that. Think about his word picture that he used to try to help them understand this doctrine of separation. And I want to go back and I want to read a story in the Old Testament that brought this alive to me. 1 Samuel chapter 5. I know we're in the Old Testament, but just something to, to get, help us gain a a vision of what our writer, what this writer, what the Lord is trying to teach us through this writer this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Verse 4, And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon had was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. <clears throat> what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What association, as some man said, or what covenant agreement can the saints who are the temple of God have with idols or their worshipers? Unquote. We, we see this come alive in this picture of this God falling on its face twice and a second time breaking in pieces. There is no room for idols in the temple of an holy God. And I'm going to go now with, 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 with me to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to spend the rest of the morning there. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> sure we're going to run out of time this morning, but we're going to see what we can get done here. Romans 12, verse 1. Verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be ye conformed, and be ye not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <clears throat> I want to also just, you don't have to turn to it, read here in 1 John 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So this call for separation continues. We see here a call to be not conformed and a call to be transformed. It's a separation to love the Father, to love the things of God, and to find ourselves in the will of God. So what does that mean? What does that involve? And what areas does the Christian today need to be separate in? And we're going to get very, very, not very far in this today, and it factors into many, many areas of life. <clears throat> As we consider the fact of our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost and of the presence of God moving with us through the day, separation comes out in everyday living. How does it come out? We want to kind of go through uh, Romans 12 here, maybe verse by verse, and there's a lot in here but kind of see a little bit of the contrast, the separation that needs to happen in the life of the Christian. See what it looks like. See what a separate person looks like. Verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we're going to start off here with the idea or with the thought of being separate in our view of ourselves. What do you think about you this morning? What comes to mind when you think about you or me, when I think about me? Do we need to be separate in the view of ourselves? It says to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. So there's a couple things in here we're going to pull out. So how do you view yourself? How do I view myself? We live in a world full of proud people. Is that true? A world full of proud people. Well, friends, this morning, I'm not going to speak for the rest of you, but your pastor struggles with pride too, Okay? And as I studied this, and as I thought about my life, every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, we need to be separate in our view of ourselves. We live in a, a world full of corrupt power. We live in a world that looks out for themselves and for their rights. But I believe Paul is bringing this a little closer home. And he says, every man among you. As a church this morning, dear people, we have got to be a people that doesn't think higher of ourselves than we ought to think. And that is a challenge that I struggle with. How do I view myself? Proverbs writer says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better is it to be of an humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So how do we find our church family this morning? Those of you who are visiting, how is it in your church family? Or the group that you call home? What is the view of yourselves? How do you view those? How do those around you view you? How do they view me? Maybe it's on a business level or those that we communicate with or talk to. Do they see a man or a woman who has a proper view of himself? What about our children? What do they see in us? Do they see someone that doesn't think too highly of themselves? Another thing we have here, it says to think soberly, and Jason already alluded to that. Am I separate in the way I think? Do I think soberly 
1 Peter chapter 1. I want to read that read a verse, a couple verses here. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 13 says this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. This idea, this, this word sober has the idea, yes, of being of abstaining from alcohol, but it also gives us the idea of our conduct or our character. Are we careful or sober in what we do and how we do it and how we relate to those that we come in contact with? Another thought was, are we careful not to cause offense? I'm not talking about offense for the truth. I'm talking about offense because of our obnoxious behavior or something of that nature. Are we, do we think soberly? Is our, is, our, is our life a picture of a separated thinker? It also gives us the idea of our conversation. It says to gird up the loins of our mind. We need to be intentional how we think and how we talk and how we use our mind. We need to be careful. Back to Romans chapter 12 here in verse number 3. Actually, verse number four, we're going to start for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body of Christ and every one members one of another. For six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And there is many, many things we could pull out of these few verses as we think about a separated life. But I, I guess I come back to the brotherhood of church. How we look at each other, how we view each other. One body, one body in Christ. Are we separate in our view of ourselves and does it come out? in the view of each other. We're going to quickly go through these, these next verses here, and we'll read them slowly. We don't have time for a lot of, of comment. But think about a separated life as you read through these verses. Verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Are we separate in our love to each other? As soon as you cross me, you're done. Or is it a real love that lasts and forgives and forgives be, ye kind, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. That is a separated view of life in the world we live in. Verse number 11, not slothful in business. How do we conduct our business? How do we do our job? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Are we real? Is the reason we're here this morning for a real purpose and reason? Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. This is another call. and We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. But this is a call for separation under trial. When we are down and we are out. And when, when we have gone through some, some whatever it may be, are we separate in our response to adversity? Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Here again, dear friends, this morning, we don't own anything. 
It's not our money. It's not our houses. It's not our vehicles. It's not our stuff. Are we willing to share with our brethren? That is a separate lifestyle that is foreign to a lost and dying world. Given to hospitality, opening our hearts and our homes to our friends and neighbors. And it's getting harder here, so hold on with me. We've got a few more verses to go through, and it ain't getting easier. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. How can we do that? You and I know nothing about suffering for what's right, at least that I'm aware of. Yes, we might get a funny look sometime, but no one has ever physically assaulted me for what I believe. I've never had the opportunity to bless someone that's touched the lives of one of my family members. That's separation. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. You know the saying is, if you're rich and famous, you have lots of friends. But if you don't have anything this morning in this world and you're holding a sign that says hungry, separate, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Do you and I care about each other no matter our circumstances? Number 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Here we go, another hard one. When somebody gets me, I want to get them back. God is calling us to be separate. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. I'm a business owner. I deal with a lot of people, a lot of customers, a lot of vendors. And you know, honesty and integrity, and I'm talking to all of us, but maybe especially our young people, honesty and integrity matters. It means what it says. We are to be honest in the sight of all men. Never can we be backed into a corner and proven where we lied or give a false measure or did something wrong. Yes, we do. We confess it, we make it right, we go to that person and we tell them, look, I was dishonest in that. There's times we fail, but may we never have it on our hearts and our conscience, unconfessed dishonesty. We are called to be separate. Verse 18, if it be possible. Boy, this is a tough one too. As much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. And that doesn't mean that you can do that. You can do it on your side. You can be at peace with all men. You can, be at re you can forgive. You can live above bitterness. You cannot make them forgive. You cannot make them forget. But you can, as much as life in you, we are called to live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place or, give, or, or, or allow it to maybe flow off of you unto wrath. For it is written, notice this, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's simply letting the unjust that you and I feel, we, you and I face in life, let all the injustice of the world, let them land in the, in the arms of a sovereign God, and he will do as he will. It says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay whatever that may be. Verse 20, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Dear friends, this morning as we think about life and how a call to be separate can, can flow out of us, this chapter challenged me on so many levels. 
I don't think I have any enemies this morning. There again, I'm a blessed person. I've never been severely wronged by anybody in my life. But could I supply his basic needs to live if I was? It says, if he hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. From so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. No, but I have been injured. My little ego has been injured many times. And I have battled with forgiveness and bitterness in my life over the smallest little tiny things. I confess to you this morning. How could I ever feed and clothe an enemy? The last verse here is, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Here again, dear people, we are called to be in this world, to be good, to be disciples, to be little Christ, to walk and talk and, and, and live and work and have jobs and be. But we are not to be overcome. We're supposed to be a part of what overcomes. And will Christ see, will people see Christ shining through me in my life? Will they see a separated person that has just went through these verses as they look at my life and as they look at your life? And I don't know where the Lord's going to lead this message. That's all I'm going to have to share this morning. I'm sorry I went late. But as you think about your life and, your, and the call to be separate and what that looks like and what it may look like in the future if the world tarries, may we be faithful to be a part of that good that overcomes evil. Shall we stand together for prayer?